I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Sometimes it takes a different approach to help you unlock your true potential. Capella University's game-changing FlexPath format helps you learn at your own pace and fit earning a degree into your life. From before you enroll to after you graduate, you'll be supported by people who are invested in your success so you can pursue your goals knowing that help is available if you need it. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show in law school, a teacher would be like, oh, so um, what kind of law do you want to practice? And I would say, bold face in the class, I'm going to be a comedian. (laughs) I told this to the Solicitor General of Illinois, all this stuff. And there, I kind of felt people pull back. And that's when I felt the shame. Like, what am I really doing? What if this doesn't work out? It's almost like you have to break out of the matrix to kind of say, okay, I just spent 12 years in grade school, four years in college, three years in law school, all for this one goal to become a lawyer and society approves and you broke out of the shackles. There must have been this enormous psychological dissonance at that moment. Well, at first I kind of felt like a fraud because I would tell people I want to be a comedian, but I knew I sucked. And so like, you know, I'm telling my parents, I'm telling all these people I'm going to be a comedian and I was bad. And that's what kind of tortured me more than anything. So why did you decide not to be a lawyer and go for a stand-up comedy? At the end of the day, what I'm pursuing is like trying to be my own fan. So this is James Altucher, of course. I've got Bill Batit with me. Now, Bill, how's it going? It's going great. How's it going? Excellent. So, Bill, I met you on Quora. Uh, Quora is this Q&A website that we're both on. You have 50,000 followers there. Your answers are phenomenal. You answer everything from relationships to comedy to just in general, how one could live a better life. And uh, you've had lots of different experiences. You were born in London, grew up partly in Hong Kong, partly in Texas. Now you live in Chicago. You just finished a year of doing 367 straight nights of stand-up comedy, which I want to ask you about. And you also quit law school, right? Or or, or have you quit law school yet? Or I just graduated from law school. What? Yeah, so I just graduated? Yeah, yeah, I graduated two weeks ago. But now you're not going to be a lawyer. You're pursuing stand-up comedy. Yes. So I want to ask you about that, like why you decided you had the fork in the road Probably everybody, parents, friends, teachers, society want to be a lawyer, and you chose to follow a dream instead. So normally, and I was telling you this earlier, normally I have someone on the podcast who's like at the end of their career. They've already been the world chess champion or wrote the TV show or been an astronaut into outer space. You're kind of at the beginning of what what is a really great start to career. You have a, a, a weekly show or bi-weekly show at the Laugh Factory in Chicago for, for stand-up. Again, you did these 367 straight nights. You have a huge following on, on Quora and on the, on the internet. And you gave up 
the societal dream, the filter dream, where you know society constantly filters you from school to graduate school to okay, be a good lawyer and get married and whatever. You just you you gave up on that to the unfiltered one of I'm gonna be the, the probably the worst profession possible, a stand up <laughs> comedian. So 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 I want to ask you about that, but also I kind of just want to have fun on this podcast. I have my list of favorite sitcoms. I'm sure you have your list. I want to just swap lists here. So, but first, let me tell me why did you decide not to be a lawyer and go for stand-up comedy? You're you're gonna fail at it probably. Well, so the thing is, is like I, I like I calculated it out, and um, being one of the hardest working comedians is still being one of the like least efficient, least hardworking lawyers. So I thought, well, I can outwork a lot of these guys and there's not nearly as many people trying to be comedians. So I was just like, yeah, let me do that. And then on top of that, I was like, artificial intelligence is like wiping out a lot of what lawyers do. And so I was like, well, what, what way? Uh, so they're like coming out with a lot of new software with machine learning software that's basically getting rid of um, a lot of doc review, a lot of first year associates positions, and then a lot of what lower level lawyers used to do with legal zoom, um, um, rocket lawyer and stuff like that, where a lot of what lawyers do is just being taken by technology or being automated or they're um, combining it with people, outsourcing it and then combining it with machine learning. And so a lot of these jobs are going away and they're just not coming back. So let me ask you this question about lawyers because- Normally, I wouldn't have a lawyer on the podcast yeah. just because, not that I dislike them, but there's just no reason. Yeah. And I mean, I have lawyers, I have friends who are lawyers. I feel I feel like in that racist commercial, like, oh, I have a friend. <laughs> Little Jimmy's a lawyer. I'm friends with a lawyer. But uh, uh, what I want to ask you is, sometimes I go to a lawyer and I say, I need to set up a company and a basic agreement with a partnership and a few other simple things. I feel like this is boilerplate stuff. And the lawyer will charge 30000 And so one time I took the boilerplate and I was setting up a new company. Specifically, it was a, a new kind of fund that I was starting. And the lawyer somehow got a hold of this paperwork I did. I, I rewrote it myself to, to just white it out their stuff and just put in new things. And he, he called me up screaming and he said, I'm shocked. I've never seen a client do this. You can't do this. This is inappropriate. And I said, I spent $30,000 for your documents. I could do whatever I want yeah. with this. Like, why? It seems like so much of, even without the machine learning, it seems like so much of what lawyers do is boilerplate and I could just take it. Like, like I could, it's like legal. I could just download, let's say, divorce documents. Why do I need to pay $100,000 for a divorce document when it's, again, all boilerplate? You're exactly right. And that's why lawyers are facing a lot of this, especially when we've moved away from legalese and writing things in clearer language. It, a lot of times you just don't need a lawyer and it's just cultural to go there. And more and more people are finding out due to like, having more information that they don't don't need lawyers. Yeah, like to to for 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 many basic things. For many basic things. And then like the thing is I think you'll always need lawyers for like litigation and stuff like that, but that's a very small part of what lawyers do. A lot of it's just like writing up documents, stock review. And so and then um on top of that JP Morgan has a new software out where it did like 300,000 hours of billable work in like a weekend. And so like this is this stuff is just going to continue. Oh, and to get I read back. about that. That was with AI. Yeah. So uh, I want to describe to you again, though, but getting back to my point that a lot of this stuff is is easy. My my divorce, my first divorce, uh, uh, makes me sound like I'm this old man who constantly <laughs> like gets divorced. But uh, my my divorce, I wrote up everything. I wrote up all the points, and I said I just need someone to kind of make it look legal and then submit it to the courts. And I paid. So I wrote up every single point. My ex-wife and I agreed to every single point. We signed it. I said, I just need like the name of the law firm and you to submit this to a court. I paid $1,000. Oh, and here's what we did. We moved all of our assets to a corporation where we were 50-50 partners. Mm. And then we simply got divorced with no assets because all the assets were in the corporation. That's And it was so totally simple divorce. And But we, we were able to get legally divorced. And then financially, we kind of de dealt with it over time, the assets of that corporation. So isn't that like a great way to get a cheap divorce? I guess so. I mean, I didn't really study family law. But like, yeah, that seems like a easy. I think the more you know what you're doing, the more you know what you're dealing with, the less people can sell you things you know that you don't want, you know, or sell you services that you didn't really ask for. So, okay, I want to get into now... Because a hardworking lawyer, if you put that kind of effort and productivity into stand-up comedy, you know most of your competition won't do that. So that will give you 
a higher chance of success at at stand up comedy. Yeah, so kind of it was like a really quantitative. Well, like I came to the decision that I wanted to be a stand up comic um, during Yom Kippur. Um, I'm not Jewish, but uh, like uh, you're Malaysian, <laughs> Indian, yeah, some other um, half black, and then yeah, you're like all these things. <laughs> yeah, well, the Yom Kippur thing. A um, friend of mine, she just told me, well, you you fast for a day, don't drink food, um, don't eat food, don't drink water, and you think about if today was the last day I was alive, what would I have done differently about my life? I was like, oh, that sounds like a great thing to do. So I did it. And at the time, I had an offer to go to the Marine Corps um, to be a JAG officer. And the only thing I had to do was the— What's a JAG officer? So it's a military lawyer for um, basically handling things out in the military. Mm -hmm. And um, they, there was a dearth of uh, Marine lawyers that year. And um, the recruiter came out to our school, basically said I had the grades and everything. And all I had to do is come do a physical fitness, and then I could go to— um, uh, basic training and all that other stuff. And I kept calling him to get back in touch with him about um, setting up the day for me to do the physical training. And he didn't get back to me. So then I fast for the whole day. And I'm thinking like, well, you know, I don't know if I really want this. I don't know if I really want to be a Marine lawyer. Like, it sounds really cool. But I know I'll do six years and then be like, kind of wish I just did stand-up. And so at that point, I made the call. My mom, I'm like, I'm going to be a stand-up comedian. She's like, oh, my God. Not not again, because I had just read your book, Choose Yourself, and I started this corporation where I was going to like use behavioral economics to basically help people make their coffee shops more efficient. And um, so I was like— how, how can you make your coffee shop more efficient using behavioral economics? Dude, I was going to figure out a way <laughs> and like just watch and just look at how people could position things. But I never really got started on that. And I started going up to, on open mics just periodically, and then it started increasing with time. And then I just started really investing in it. Then I looked at people like Louis C.K. and Jerry Seinfeld, and they have a lot of career capital. And meaning that they could do basically anything they want with their careers. Like Louis made a FX sitcom where he basically had all the rules and was able to walk away and do another really great moving piece online, have great people willing to work with him. And so I was like, wow, all of this for being funny. And then I thought about the characteristics of a comedian is high capacity for shame, um, being able to look at life from a unique way. And I felt like a lot of my life had geared me up for this. So I was like, look, I'm in one of the best cities in the country for comedy. Let me just really take advantage of this and let me really commit. And at that point, I just didn't look back. I was just like, I'm going to be a comedian. And I oriented my entire focus on that. So whenever I decided um, that I was going to do that, I canceled a trip to go to Brazil for the Olympics with my best friend. I said I was going to go up every night. Um, I completely just changed everything. And that investment showed my parents like, oh my God, he's really serious about this. And then from there, I kind of cultivated this really huge love for stand-up. And it kind of imbued my life with meaning the more the more I sacrificed for it and the harder I pursued it. So I want to I want to ask about that. There's there's actually a lot of things in what you just said that I want to ask about. I mean, first off, it's really impressive that you were able to kind of break it's almost like you have to break out of the matrix to kind of say, "Okay, I just spent 12 years in grade school, 4 years in college, 3 years in law school, all for this one goal to become a lawyer, and now I'm just simply and society approves." Yep. Like my parents approve you know, my my ethnic parents approve, which yeah. is different different than American parents in, yeah. in many ways. It, they approve because it's like this American dream and they're here and so on. And you broke out of the shackles. There must have been this enormous psychological dissonance at that moment. Well, at first, I kind of felt like a fraud because I would tell people I want to be a, I want to be a comedian. But I knew I sucked. And so, like, you know, I'm telling my parents, I'm telling all these people I'm going to be a comedian, and I was bad. And that's what kind of tortured me more than anything. Because I, before that, I was like, I was trying to be a screenwriter, I was trying to be a novelist. And it, all these things come back to story and communication. And I knew— And like, performance. And performance. And at the end of the day, I knew I didn't want to end my career as a lawyer. And I knew that a large part of what I wanted to do was basically get my message across to people. And So a lot of people would say, okay, I'm going to um, work for 15 years as a lawyer, and then I'm either going to be like Scott Tarot and— and write financial thrillers, or then I'll go off and write my screenplay or do comedy or whatever. But I'll first I'll get that money in the bank after 15 years. Yeah, for me, it was basically like, I don't know if that opportunity is going to be there. And right now I'm young and people give opportunities to younger people. And I have all this energy and I feel like you're given a license to fail in your early 20s. And I was like, I need to take advantage of this. And I also... It That's was, a really good way to put it, like a license to fail. It's almost like along with the degree, they should hand people like that license because it's so true. Like you yeah. could fail at lots of things in your 20s without the same effect after you have kids, a mortgage, money, you know, that you that you worked hard for, that it would be very disappointing to lose. So you do have all these reasons. You have permission to try things. Exactly. And I mean, like, you have permission later on, but it's much harder to convince yourself of that. 
I, exactly. It was exactly that. I don't have a wife. I don't have a kid. I'm, I'm, I'm single right now. And I have the time to invest in these friendships and everything like that that really help your career in stand-up. And I was surrounded by a great group of guys. And basically, we just fed each other momentum. And one of the things that I want to point out is like having— have, Amongst your friends, not all of you can be motivated all the time. But if you're in a motivated group of people, different ones of you will be motivated at different times to keep you motivated. So we it just kind of we kept pushing each other, and through these hard times, we kept and had this like really healthy competition, and it just kept building and building and building. And then um, yeah, and it just started kind of really exploding this year. Like with us getting moved to Laugh Factory, we started at like a really bad Puerto Rican place, and then moved to like just a regular bar. And then um, another comedy club came and saw us, and we're like, hey, do you want to? Run a show there. We sold it out. Then so this is great. So this is like instead of just going up on the open mics and hoping someone chooses you, you created your show, picked a place, and then moved up from there. You that's a, a choose yourself type of story. Th that's exactly what it is. Is basically we had to choose ourselves because we weren't getting stage time, and so we were like, well, we need to give ourselves stage time. And so we stood outside. We flyered every day. We're I mean we're messaging hundreds of our friends personally on top of inviting them like please come out to the show. Um, I mean and like just really thrusting ourselves in kind of these shameful situations like I remember one time I was um, promoting a show and it was a different show but it was downtown and um, I see my friends walking out their law jobs where they're getting paid like $32,000 that summer and some of them are pretending like I don't exist like you know like pretending like I'm not there and I was like oh my god like I can't believe I'm out here in this hot sun barking for three hours a day I don't know if any of these people are going to show up and then um, it ended up being a packed house in there and it really showed me that it's these little things that work and thrusting yourself into shame is what really helps you grow and that's what I, I did a TED talk on that, which is basically how having a high capacity for shame is the secret to success. And that no matter what, if you're truly successful, someone's going to be laughing at you. So go ahead and just do it. I want to, I want to write that down. High capacity for shame is a secret for success. Yeah. So what do you mean in the sense that a, you felt shame asking people on the street to come to your show. So you had to kind of get very comfortable talking, cold talking to strangers just walking past you in the street. Yeah. And then B, you had to go up on, like, so when you first begin any career that you love, be, there's two things that happen. And, and this is a, a kind of well-known phenomenon. You love it so you understand the skill level of the top people. Like you understand why they are good and people below them are second tier and people below that are third tier and why you are at the bottom. You understand all the subtleties because you love it. So you, yeah. your brain has, has that love has converted into a, a knowledge uh, that it's at a deeper level than most people. But then when you first start, because you're just starting, you're going to suck. You might have some talent so you're not at the bottom level, but you might be second or third from the bottom. So... How do you not just give up then? How do you say, I can close that gap between the top tier where I recognize the subtleties and I, and, I, and I love that top tier and where I am now and I know I suck so bad right now? It's the power of um, selective delusion. <laughs> like basically, I was- You have to have some kind of ego, yeah. whether you're a novelist or any kind of outside the filter- dream is going to have this problem, this gap, yeah. this talent or skill gap. Most definitely. Well, you have to have an ego to get up there, but then you have to have a, you have to like kind of suppress that ego in order to go through that process. So like the, one of the things that causes a lot of people to bomb at stand up is they go up there with an ego and expectation to be good. And that ru it, there's something about whenever someone expects you to laugh, not confidently, you know, is expressing themselves, but like needs your laughter um, that people don't want to laugh. They tighten up. So and give me an example of someone who doesn't do that. Like, so what you're really talking about I've heard to as referred to as selling the joke. You have to yep. really sell the joke. And if you lose that confidence mid joke because you think you're not funny or you think people are not laughing or you start to experience shame, yeah. you won't be able to fully sell the joke. Exactly. Is it, so so what does that mean and what's an example of someone who's done it? Well so it's any any famous comedian you see, Bill Burr especially, commits to the bit, right? Like or Patrice O'Neill, they they take the bit and they they do it, right? And if you don't laugh, you're dumb for laughing. Right, and they're they're enjoying themselves. But whenever you see open micers if they, and it doesn't hit, you'll hear it in their voice first. Their voice all of a sudden gets crackly, uh, and they're not saying in the same pitch, or they start they they start closing off, or they move an arm in, or they like, oh, that was stupid, and they step on their thing. But when you get up there, you're supposed to believe in it, even if no one else does. And that's hard to game yourself into doing. Especially, it's almost like you have to develop a persona. It, oh, you have to develop a character, and it's it's really hard because like there's. It, Stand up, like one of my friends, his name is Jeremy Scipio. He runs a, a show at the Comedy Store and he's really great. And he, he told me, 
Will, your stand-up doesn't have to be true, but it has to be honest. It has to feel honest. What do you mean the difference between true and honest? So, um, like, when you say, you can say something true, right? And But it doesn't feel honest. Like, if I was like, well, yeah, you know, um, I, I believe in myself. I could be saying the truth, but it doesn't feel honest. And it, it, when you're up there, the audience has to be bought into you. And the only way you can do that is if you're selling it as if it's real, you know, as if you really believe this. So let me let me ask you this question, because uh, it seems like a lot of comedy, and, and I know we're kind of going all over the place, but it's, yeah. it's such a fascinating topic to me. And it's related to something you said earlier, that comedy imbued your life with meaning. And I think that has deeper connotations than just career and something that everybody can benefit from. So I want to dive into that. But it seems like a lot of comedy when it terms to when it comes to this kind of honesty is you you develop a perso- persona where you subtract a little bit of yourself. For instance, Larry David in the show Curb Your Enthusiasm, mm-hmm. he is like the real Larry David, but he subtracts from himself any sense of etiquette mm-hmm. or or like personal boundaries somehow so he becomes this like persona of Larry David where he subtracted some socially acceptable version of he he subtracted something socially exep, acceptable from himself in order to create this funnier persona is that uh comedy is that like I've seen that almost as the definition of comedy yeah because if you if you are 100% yourself you can sound self righteous right like the, 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 there needs to be a failing with you on stage like my my character on stage is existential nihilist amoral right like like what's this guy going to say and like that's that's the kind of fun I have but like do I really believe all the stuff I say no do I live my life like that no but I kind of do believe some of the stuff I say and like Amy Schumer's got the persona where she plays this like sluttier version of herself exactly. like she said and she has said in many interviews she's not like that but on stage she is yep and Jim Gaffigan is another example where he basically subtracts from himself all knowledge of like healthy eating for yeah. as an example and I'm trying to think of some others. You know, those are the classic examples yeah. I can think of. Well, like, Dave, for example, Dave Chappelle. Like, Dave Chappelle is really deep and methodical. And if you ever listen to him in interviews or anybody who's had a conversation, it's like, wow, you know, it's he's real. He's really a thinker. And you see that in his comedy, too, but he's also silly, you know? And, and so, like, it's just, I think, playing with those parts of yourself and understanding that you can't be completely yourself up there. Like, you, there's going to be an element of you up there, but it's not going to be 100% you, you. But they always say, like, like Louis C.K. is another example, they always say he, his comedy really, kind of took it to the next level when he started to become more himself. So the thing is, like, early Louis C.K. was a lot more absurdist, right? And it wasn't a lot more of what he thought or things like that. And I think one of the things that changes and evolves over time is your point of view. And so, like, I think his point of view is more him, but I don't ever think as a performer you're going to ever be complete, like, because I think part of what makes creativity beautiful is the fact that it has some form of restrictions in it. Even if you're playing completely free, you restrict yourself in order to have something so you don't blind yourself with the light or things like that. So this gets to how comedy imbues your life with meaning, you said, but I think it imbues life with meaning because when you when you go into a situation and you say, okay, I'm not just in a room, but I'm in a room with all of these awkward and weird things happening, you start to notice more things. You kind of notice kind of the, the silliness or the absurdity of the many things around you and you figure out ways to communicate that. Like it seems like there's a, a bigger picture, not just to being a stand-up comedian, but to understanding this almost philosophical way of thinking about comedy. Most definitely. Like, so for example, my show when I'm in Edinburgh is called If You Feel Like Killing Yourself, Call Me. And basically the entire thing is about like being able to like laugh at a lot of these really painful parts of life, right? And I I think laughter is there so we can get access to some of the things that are really uncomfortable to, for us to play with, unless we can laugh about it. And I've had moments where like during this period of time where like I've been pushed to tears or whatever because of romantic things or other things like that. And I'm cracking jokes on myself in my head during this moment. And it's allowing me to experience it, but it's also showing me like how full of shit shit I am in this, you know, and like kind of wallowing. And so it kind of treats you in the same way. It kind of relieves you of a lot of pain, even while you're feeling it, because you can see also the joke in you. Yeah, I guess. And I guess that's related to the the comedy is subtraction in the sense that we aren't all as high as we think we are. No, you got to really in many situations we're really much worse than we than we would like to think we are, you know, like in a breakup or in a parenting situation or, you know, there's a lot of times, and, you know, Louis C.K. makes a joke about this, when I have an 18-year-old and a 15-year-old, so I remember all the years they were growing up. So let's say when they were seven or eight, 
I'd be at some point, maybe they would do something that made me upset. And suddenly I'm this big human being towering over a little person, <laughs> you know, about to be upset. And like, that's a horrific thing. If, yeah. they, if it wasn't for the fact that she was my daughter, if I was just like went up to some random seven year old <laughs> and started screaming at them that I would be an insane person. And you kind of have to take a step back and say, well, I'm actually an insane person right now, even doing this with my daughter. So, yeah. but that's how every parent is. And it's kind of like this, again, this, this ability to subtract. It's like, it's like, again, I'll use Larry David and his, as an example on the sitcom Curb Your Enthusiasm. He's constantly in every single show almost, looking at what the conventional rules of polite society are and questioning them. Yeah. And it's that ability to kind of take a step back and say, we don't have to be um, the best societal person. We can take a, subtract that part of ourselves and be, you know, a little bit more honest, a little bit more self-deprecating, a little bit more humble. And that's what you're saying comedy kind of, in, in terms of viewing your life for meaning rather than subtracting, it actually helps you kind of find viewpoints that might be really what you believe in. Most definitely. And that's exactly how I got over like part of the shame thing was I was able to get distance from myself and be able to laugh at it and realize like if I accomplish all the things I truly want to accomplish, tons of people are going to be laughing at me. Tons of people are going to be talking bad about me. And like to go back to the thing about you were talking about with your daughter, I just couldn't help but think it's like, you know what makes it accept acceptable that you yell at her is that you love her, which is kind of like a bizarre thing is that we're mm -hmm. like love gives us access to treat, treating the people around us worse, you know, and um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal that. And, and it, it's really, that's what I love about comedy is just that you don't take life seriously. You don't take yourself seriously. And that's, that's the beauty of it. And, and I'm, I've become so much happier living in that world, right? Because like one of the things that um, I think is a big detriment to people is we so desperately want to be taken seriously. Like really, like we, we get her all these accomplishments and it's just like, and in the end, it doesn't really matter. So, so, okay. So let's say the first 20 times, you, you did it 367 days in yeah. a row. The first 20 times you're up there, you, you start telling jokes. Sometimes you do, some days you, I'm sure you did great. Some days you did okay. Some days you, there was complete silence. Um, what would you, what would be going through your head when you just gave up this career to be a lawyer, you're, you're going against what everyone says, you're going to be a comedian, you're on stage, 60 eyes or, or 60 pairs of eyes are looking at you and not a single person's laughing. What's going through your head at that moment and then afterwards? So early on, it was actually kind of easy because I, I had done like like kind of like uh, quasi like dating coaching before and stuff like that. So I was used to kind of like the embarrassment and I had already accepted I'm going to be bad for a while. So like part of it was like, oh man, it didn't work. What, what started to cause me pain was after I got pretty good. And then I'd bomb, right? And then I'd, I'd be like, is it personal? Like, was it the room? Who was it? And I would actually um, look for somebody to blame. Right. I'd be like, oh, it was the audience's fault or like this or that or that's why they weren't laughing. But then you listen to the tape recording and you realize, no, that I missed out words here. I'm stumbling all over my punches. But I didn't really think of it. I didn't really think of like I'm giving up the law for this in those moments. I'd or there was that one decision where I was just like, I'm committing to this. And then that was it. And um after the times it was the most painful was like in law school, whenever I would like a teacher would be like, oh, so um, what kind of law do you want to practice? And I would say bold face in a class, I'm going to be a comedian, <laughs> you know? And I told this to like the Solicitor General of Illinois, all this stuff. And, um, and there I kind of felt people pull back. And that's when I felt the shame. Like, what am I really doing? What if this doesn't work out? But what if your friends were in the audience when you were, and, and you were totally bombing? Were you embarrassed in front of your friends? So it... I didn't invite out friends until I started being funny because I knew if I wanted them to come out ever again, I would have to be complete. So um, that's what I was always most afraid of during shows is I was like, I invited these people out and if I bomb, they're going to be like, what? This guy is choosing this and he's bombing right now. He's and But then I realized like other people's beliefs don't make your beliefs valid. And I realized that like through, I did a startup whenever I graduated from college in um, my gap year, I moved to Malaysia and I did start with my friend where we poured in all our graduation money. And it was actually similar to Quora. It was called My Opinion, but we didn't know about Quora at the time. And our app ended up not working. But when I told my mom about the idea and told her that we had just got them um, secured, the coders, he, um, she was like, she, she didn't believe in me. And I, I was like, oh, you know, I'm going to show you. And our business failed. Right. It failed. And I realized her belief didn't make it fail. It, even if she believed in it, we wouldn't have succeeded or not. We didn't have a business plan. We didn't know what we were doing. We, we didn't do enough research on the company. Our marketing strategies were really crude. And so 
I realized early on uh, other people's beliefs don't necessarily make your dreams valid. Doesn't doesn't necessarily make your, your pursuit valid or invalid. I'll write that down. Um, but were you embarrassed then telling her, "Oh, your mom, you were right. We failed." Uh, you know what? No, because I was able to laugh about it. And uh, how, how did you laugh about it? I was just like, "Yeah, it just didn't work." The the guys stopped picking up our phone calls after they had turned in a really bad beta version for the app that couldn't make it past the app store. And um, yeah, I'm like, "Mom, they're not picking up the thing." Then we try to switch leverage. I use I try to build a social networking site on Ning. And at the end of the day, um, yeah, it was just kind of just I didn't really take it personally because you know. It's not up to her to believe in it. <laughs> like, you know, it's it, she doesn't believe in it, she doesn't believe in it, you know? So 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 uh I'm always fascinated. I mean, I'm I'm taking this in my own direction because right now I'm to trying stand up comedy. Yeah. I've been going every week. I've been going twice a week to different clubs and not every day like you did, yeah. but uh I've been doing this now for a couple of months. And uh uh it used to be I would get very nervous for public speaking. I've done a lot of public speaking over the past 20 years. So, and I got, I think, pretty good at it to the point where people were always laughing when I did public speaking, but that's very different from comedy. In public speaking, you're storytelling. There's not necessarily a punchline. Um, there's a lot of different skills involved. And then I, and I, but I was always scared. Now when I go up to the mic for, to do stand-up comedy, I'm very scared. It's like 10 times harder mm -hmm. than public speaking. And by the way, after doing a bunch of stand-up, my public speaking has gotten a lot better. Yep. That I like... It's unbelievable the difference now in my public speaking. I feel like I totally tear up the room, but I'm scared to death every time I do stand up. Like, how did you initially get over that fear? And again, it's related to shame, but I still don't know how to get over it. Well, so the thing that makes stand up so much scarier than public speaking is number one, you, at times you have a confrontational audience, so and you feel it. Like you, you, you're like um, you walk up in the room and the people are like, "Oh, so this guy thinks you're fu he, you think you're funny, make us laugh," and you're getting this feedback loop of like what how I'm doing, and not only you know how you're doing, everybody in the room knows how you're doing, and it's audible. <laughs> like there's no other art form like it. And um, how I got over that was um, it, it just I just knew that I had to do it. And I, I kind of would, before I got on stage, I I kind of walk around and pace to get rid of some of the energy. Because if I just am sitting there, it just like builds and builds and builds and builds. And then I get up and I kind of come off crackly. But um, with the difference between public speaking, my public speaking skills actually hindered my stand-up for a while. Because I had this like, Hmm. fake public speaking voice that I would have. It's like, hey, how's it going, guys? Uh, blah, blah, blah. You know, and that sounds, that doesn't sound funny at all. <laughs> like, you know, and I, so I had to untrain myself of trying to look cool as a public speaker to being that comedian, right? Where I'm like, hey, you know, like I'm your friend up here. And so that, and then you're instantly getting judged. So I used to wear like really tight clothes on stage. I work out a lot and I was like bald. And so people would see like, who's this commando looking wannabe dude getting on stage? Why would you shave your head? You have hair. Yo, so I shaved my head because <laughs> I, I, I liked the look of it and I was I, I had a receding hairline and I was like you know what uh, forget it I'm just gonna shave my head completely bald and so I did it and then I looked 100% black at the time and so I was like yeah my black half like repping it <laughs> and um and then I uh, decided to grow out my hair for comedy and then um it's been fun you know I had to get the crazy thing about this is I had to get rid of half my material because um I'd written so many like so much black material but it didn't people weren't resonating with it anymore even even if they intellectually knew I was black and it's because it just looked like this Indian guy who's like telling black people jokes <laughs> Let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast, and I've been a guest on his, you can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the Prize Picks community each week. Look, Prize Picks 
even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But People in general love learning and are curious, like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180-plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180-plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So... This holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance. 
I just want to say thank you to everyone listening to this. I hope you enjoy what I've been doing. I don't ask for a lot, but please take a moment to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever it is you get your podcasts. It will only take you a second, but it will help other people discover the podcast. And my goal is to share this great content with as many people as possible. To see the show notes, just head on over to jamesaltature.com slash podcast. While you are there, you can join my free insiders list to get notified when I post a new podcast. Once again, thanks so much for joining me on the journey of this podcast. So, you know, when I hear a lot of comedians, even like comedians that go on, on, you know, all the late night shows and whatever, I see them perform at the local clubs here. Here's what I don't like. I don't like when they go on and tell a joke just for the laughs, even if it's a Mm -hmm. funny joke. So I'll give you an example. There was a guy on the last time I went on, he was on right before me and he was funny. I was even laughing at his jokes, but I still didn't like it. He And he had been on Letterman, he had been on Colbert, he had been on a bunch of things. And I'll give you an example of one of his jokes. Uh, I won't say it like how he said it, I'll just sort of describe it. But he was basically saying, why do they always announce, uh, be aware of the gap on subways? Are we really losing that many people to the gap? Like, did three of us start to go to the subway and only two of us ended up? And we were like, where's Lenny? Yeah. Oh, we must have lost him to the gap. So, so... Uh, and it's just like last week, we lost Johnny to the gap. Like, are we really losing all that many people to the gap? And the audience was laughing and it was kind of like this funny idea, but I felt like it was so just a joke and a punchline and not real and just for the laughs and not really saying anything about himself mm-hmm. that it was completely uninteresting to me, even though I could clearly see why he was getting, everybody was laughing in the crowd. So, so what's up with that? And I, and I felt like that was capping his career almost. The fact that he was sort of stopping at that point where he knew he could get a laugh, but he wasn't diving deep for it. Uh, uh, like I think it's one of the lev- levels of comedy. So I've heard it described to me about the, like this is like at the first level you're just saying anything that can be funny. Then the second level is you're saying kind of stuff that you think is funny. And then the third one is like you're you're talking about what you really feel and making it funny. And at the end of the day, what I'm pursuing is like trying to be my own fan. Like I want to I want to be a fan of my own comedy, and I want the people I love and am fans of to be a fan of my comedy. And I think that's a way of staying sincere. But um, to me, I started off like that, and I did a show with a guy named Felonious Monk. He's on Comedy Central uh-huh. and the Larry Wilmore Show, and um, I he completely outclassed me in the show that we did. And he of course has many more years in the game. But one of the things was he was giving. He he wasn't just being self-deprecating to be self-deprecating or anything like that. He had points, he it, it, like, and it, it it was deep and moving. And so at that point, I had also resolved that I was going to completely change my point of view on stage because I felt bigger than my jokes. I felt like I was wasting some of it. But the thing is, it's a very painful process. And you probably were getting laughs. Lo- and then probably laughs. when you switch to being more personal, you were getting less laughs or maybe less. mediocre laughs. It, it was it, it was inconsistent. It was mediocre, and it felt to other people in the scene probably try hard at the time because like what what's he doing now oh what's he trying to do because like they've already gotten you your scene gets used to you in a certain capacity and it was about like three months it was a very painful time and i um but eventually when my point of view started coming about i'm so excited about my jokes and i I really think about them and like and they're really what i think on some of these issues so what's an example of like a before and after so before when you were just catering to the audience and after when you started developing a voice so like before like so one of my jokes was like um oh you know i was on the dance floor dancing with this girl and some dude with light up shoes started dancing and she started dancing on him and i was like man you know i wish i could buy the something about me buying light up shoes to get laid in fifth grade or something like that and it was it was it, it, whenever i told him the time it was getting consistent last but at the same time it was just it was just making me out to be like a putz kind of person and then like now like um like one of the jokes i'm working on is that if god is infinite and he has that means he has infinite intentions that means that like he wants you to fail as much as he wants you to succeed and then i just go through all these things of like examples of like god like like it's trying to like wanting you to graduate from law school but dying right afterwards 
afterwards and all these other things because it, it lays in this realm of the infinite and um, just like other like um, like ideas of like how love it doesn't exist or how it's a construct or how cheating in a relationship is only bad because society tells us it's bad and stuff like that and like playing with these ideas that where people are like you really changed what I thought on that or and um, that that to me is really exciting and um, sometimes it might take a little bit longer to get them down but like Twitter's really helped me like like really like be conservative with the words and not over explain it because you 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 almost focus group uh, uh, a joke with a 140 character tweet yeah yeah exactly I, if you can get the premise to be funny the audience is so much more willing to be on your side because like you've already given them a laugh so they're going to be able to like, okay I'm going to see where you're going to go with this and so that's why the so you try to get them to laugh before the punchline exactly and mm -hmm. then and then everything else is gravy and they they can go with you on that and especially if you're exploring something that's like like kind of taboo they need trust. Like the audience needs to trust you. Like I see a lot of guys whenever they're doing open mics, they'll try to do some like like child molestation bit right out the gate, and like nobody knows them, you know. And it's like the audience doesn't know you well enough to crack that joke. You have to build a certain amount of trust for them to let you go there sometimes. Huh? I'm gonna have to uh, scratch my child molestation <laughs> joke at the beginning of my act. So. Uh, so, okay, what did you continue to learn through the 367 days? Well, what I learned is what will help you get you one level won't help you get to the next. So actually part of what was holding back me from growing during that period of being able to make the jump into deeper jokes that I enjoyed more was the fact that I had to go up every day and I couldn't just sit on some premises and write, you know? And that kind of was taxing. Um, also, I, I learned that, um, you know... I think the hardest part about it was the last leg of it. Like the first six months, I got a lot better. And I I established myself in the scene where it's like, oh, Will, he's one of the hardest working guys. He's out there and everything like that. But after a while, it felt really tiresome. And I didn't even know why I was doing it. And there was one time I did a joke that ended up doing really well, but it bombed really bad at this mic. And I ended up tearing up afterwards. It felt very personal because when you're going up every day, your, your entire reality becomes the scene. And um, I go, I'm tearing up and... I go home and I write down everything that means more to me than stand-up. And the reason I did that was because I'm like, the audience can see I care so much at this point. Like, I care a lot whether or not this goes well because I've been going up every day, three to five times a day. Of course I care. And um, that was actually one of the biggest like moments where it's like, I'm doing this for other things as well. It's stand up isn't the end. It's one of the things. And it allowed me to be more carefree, yet still committed to what I was doing. And and were you actually more carefree afterwards? Yes, like 100%. Because I think that is important. It is. If the audience can't see it means something to you. I, I describe to people like this, when you're on a date and it's going well, right? And you're telling jokes and she's laughing the whole time. And then you tell one joke or something and then she's, she doesn't laugh. She gives kind of a, a muted response. And then you start trying to tell more and more jokes, trying to catch yourself up and she's getting more and more turned off. That's exactly how the audience feels whenever they feel you need that laugh. Mm -hmm. Whenever you're not sharing it because you want to share it, but you're sharing it because you want their laugh. Mm -hmm. And um, it, they can even laugh at the joke and not like you, which is almost worse because you, you want them to leave liking you even if they don't like the things that you say, uh, that's interesting. You want them to leave. You want them to leave liking you because you take comedians like Anthony Jeselnik. The audience isn't necessarily. Like, well, I guess I don't know. They do kind of like him, even though he's insulting them the entire yeah. time. He, he has got a certain charisma. Exactly. Well, he's not backing down, right? And he doesn't need you to laugh. Like he he, he gets off on people walking out. Like you know. Like I love his joke. Uh, you might not have heard it, but I'll just I'll just do it. Uh, he gets into this audience. He's in San Francisco, and he's like, everybody in San Francisco is so beautiful. I don't know what's going on with this crowd. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I remember. Yeah, and and people they loved it. Yeah, you know. And but like the thing is, if he like if he if he even as famous as he is, if he was like, um, everybody in in San Francisco is really beautiful, except for you guys. It, it wouldn't be the same. Right. It's the commitment to it. And it's selling the joke. It's selling the joke. And, and it, again, it's the subtracting. From his personality, like, I, like in real life, he's a nice guy. Yeah. But he's subtracting this niceness from his personality to somehow create this funny persona. Exactly. And, and I, he's sticking to that persona. He will not back off from it ever. No. He, he can have. That's what makes Bill Hicks so legendary, right? Is like Bill Hicks would walk the whole audience the first show, come do the exact same bit the second show and kill because he. He, he cared more about his art than their its reception. And I think that's also another way of kind of like, I think everybody knows what's funny. Like a lot of people say, like when you're a comedian, I feel like if you think it's funny, a lot of times 
it can be funny. Now, whether or not you deliver it in a way that can be funny is another thing. And I kind of describe it like this. It's like in, in Chicago, I know where the uh, Willis or Sears Towers is, right? But I not, might not be able to give you the exact directions to get there. But if I sit there and think about it long enough, I can probably get you to that doorstep. And I think that's the way it is with a lot of jokes. It's like, if you're like sitting there and you're like, <laughs> that's funny. There's people out there that are going to laugh, but you just got to find that way. You got to press the things. And sometimes you can write it out perfectly. Maybe it's in your delivery, you know? And that's why I think video recording yourself is really important because you can do stuff with your face that completely turns off the audience, mm. right? Like mm. um, one of the things I noticed was whenever I was writing down my bits verbatim a lot and trying to memorize them, whenever I was thinking of the joke, I would veer my eyes up. And that's what you do when you're remembering something. But that also makes it look like you're lying. Like if, you, if you're talking to someone and their eyes are veer, like kind of like veering up, it like, it's kind of insincere. It's, they're not in the moment. They're not engaging you. Well, and, let me ask you this. Like when I'm doing public speaking, I feel very much like I'm connecting with the audience. I can feel what they're feeling. I, I make them laugh. Uh, uh, I feel like I have a good voice for that. Like I, I don't take the fake voice that you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. I have my own voice after 20 years with that. I don't know how to quite connect with the audience when I'm doing stand up. I somehow or other I feel like there's this invisible wall and I don't know how to get past it. I'm going to say it honestly I feel that sometimes too. And I think the thing is the difference is the audience comes on your side in public speaking. Like they they genuinely want to succeed but the audience in stand up is really the bar is higher. Mm -hmm. We we don't only want you to do well. We want you to make me laugh. Mm -hmm. And so they're sitting there looking for where you're going to do the trick. It's like a magician. Like, like stand-up comics are a lot like magicians and that our thing is the whole surprise. And so they're looking, they're like trying to see where it's going and everything like that. So they're engaged, but they're also kind of like, show me. And I also think it sometimes it has to do with the host. Like if the host hasn't done crowd work, the audience and the, the uh, comedy is happening at the audience even if they're not laughing because so there's like a, sometimes a wall and you feel it. There's like people laughing but they're not laughing. It's not like that same energy of that give and take. How would you, what's a kind of icebreaker that you could use to kind of warm up your connections? Do you do crowd work? Yeah. Well, so so crowd work is when you talk to individual members of the audience yeah. and do something that's funny with them. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is you can just say like, you notice something and you can, you don't, it, the crowd work doesn't have to be funny. Everyone like is always trying to like look for a punch. Eventually audience members say some funny, goofy stuff because they're in a high pressure situation and you can play with that. But what it does is it gives us, we are a team vibe, right? Not like I'm here, you're there. And I think that's really important. And especially when you see crowds where crowd work is done really well and they are just receptive to every comic because it's like, it's kind of like um, the host is the host of a party and it's like if he spends some time talking with all the guests right before all his other friends come in to tell stories about their lives, that's going to be completely different than the host is like, hey, here's my day. And then, oh, here's all my other friends day. And it's like they don't even feel like they know you or why they should know you. And I mean, I'm not saying it's necessary to get laughs. I'm just saying there's a different energy in the room and it's, it's, you can feel it. So, so um, do you feel there's any kind of like rules in the sense that like one rule I heard was, and, and I don't believe in any rules, but I'm just saying what I've read or heard, uh, tell your second worst joke as the first thing and then tell your close with your best joke. Like, do you do anything like that or you don't care about that? I, I do close my best joke because people remember it. You can mm. have an amazing set. And I would also say your first joke is re really important because it shows, it shows them that, hey, I trust this guy. Like, it's like if someone's driving and, you know, and you see them just driving well at the beginning, you can kind of just relax in the back seat. Mm -hmm. um, and the last joke is really important because I've had, like, amazing sets. And then, like, you know, my last joke, bombs. And people are like, oh, you know. But right. you can have a joke bomb in the middle, come through with an amazing joke at the end. People forget that. People right. are like, oh, did that even happen? You know, and so it's it, those things really, those two points really matter. The middle, you can just play around. So, so... Originally, um, we started this podcast. I really just wanted to go over like my top ten favorite sitcoms and hear yours yeah. and what they mean to us. We veered into all this stuff, but I still want to do it. So, yeah. uh, what are some of your favorite sitcoms or comedians? Like, who who inspires you to do what you do? Like, like, like the it's obvious the top ten lawyers in the world uh, didn't inspire you to become the greatest lawyer ever. But something about the, the philosophy, the lifestyle, the demeanors of the top comedians or sitcoms or whatever inspired you to, and, and like you said, imbued your life with 
meaning. Yeah. And so that's what you decided to pursue. That's what anybody should, that's how anybody should make a decision is what gives your life meaning. Yes. So, so who, what were your inspirations? So one of my inspirations that really took my comedy on this next level turn, and he's, he's a, he's an up and coming comic. He just had his comedy central half hours, Drew Michael. Um, oh, I don't know him. Drew, my, he's amazing. And one of the things is he basically is, is unrelenting with basic being funny and right. Right. Where like, you can see him basically argue out any of these, anything that he puts forward forward in a logical capacity and he's he's deeply cre creative and vulnerable on stage and it's really engaging and kind of gave me the confidence to not to not take that early exit sometimes when I'm really wanting to hammer home a point and um and to find a creative way to do that hmm. um him Gerard Carmichael and I also love his show the Carmichael show uh Gerard Carmichael just had a special come out eight and um he also has said incredibly unpopular things but makes people explore those ideas and he has the this, both of these guys are both really known for being vulnerable on stage and saying what they think even if it's not popular and making you laugh about it while thinking on a deep level and like one of um, Gerard's jokes is um, about um, basically in society we value talents more than morals and he uses like Woody Allen as an example and it's absolutely hilarious and it kind of changed the way I looked at life and philosophy and all these other things and so those two guys I really love as comics then um, sitcom I really love Frasier like Frasier is like one of my favorite sitcoms and oh I, my god that I feel like that's so old school like I wouldn't put that in my top 10 what do you like about Frasier I, I love that you have a psychiatrist who lives with his dad and his nanny and and it, it's completely a bizarre setting, yet it feels so natural. And I like how they explore deeper, like all the relationships, like I love, it was between that and Seinfeld, but where I give Frasier, um, Frasier takes a cake for me is that um, it kind of transcends comedy sometimes in that it, it it gets really real and the writing is really great and the stage acts are really great and all the acting is really great. And one episode that really moved me was this episode where it was completely done in real time. And they talk about basically um, um, whether or not Frazier's happy. And they, they are able to dissect this philosophical issue while also making comedic, while also not having to do take advantage of all the stage, change, stage changes and making it overly farcical. And so I really love Frazier. Well, oh, okay, for, so, for some of those things like the great writing and the great acting and, and saying something real, what about Louis? I love Louis. See, I don't, I don't even know if I consider Louis a sitcom. I consider I, it's like a it's class, dark. It's dark. Well, Louis is one of the things that got me into comedy. There was an episode where his friend wants to commit suicide. Yeah, and, I remember that. Yeah, and he and he does like, or you assume uh, that at he, the end he does. He does. And the the part where like Louis gets called on the Tonight Show, and he's like, "Hey, I just got called for to do the Tonight Show." He's like, "Dude, I thought we were in this to find truth." And it hit me like comedy can be a vehicle for truth, like that episode. And I was like, I really want to try comedy after that. Well, well, there was another similar point made in another episode of Louis where he's on the road. And when you're on the road, sometimes you room you room with other comedians. Like they put you in this like the, the comedy club's like dorm room Apartment, or whatever. Yeah. And uh, uh, the other comic was just telling fart jokes the entire time. And Louis like literally started crying, talking to him. I forgot who was playing the other comedian. It was a well-known comedian also, but they didn't they didn't say who. But uh Louis started crying because he really wanted to be good at this comedy thing. He didn't feel fart jokes were good. Yep. And he thought that was just the easy way out. And the other guy was saying, No, you gotta do this. That makes people laugh. That's why people are here. And it was really it kind of left it at that point. It didn't really I think even Louis went on stage and told like a fart, a fart joke, joke after yeah. that. And it still left the point hanging about what what is truth. What was what's the art that he was really trying to to hit that vein inside himself? Yeah. Well, like the thing is that in uh, I think comedy is unique in this in that the audience control of whether or not people consider it art. Because um, I forget who brings up this point as uh, a comic, and I, I wish I could give him credit for it. But they're like, <laughs> um, basically, comedy is the only thing where it has to be good for people to call it comedy. Because if you if you just get up there and you bomb, people are like, oh, is that even comedy? And you know, you don't say that with a movie, no matter how bad the movie is. Was that even a movie? Like you know, and it's kind of like this thing where like comedy, it, it's in between, right? Like if it's just about you, that's a really interesting point. Yeah. So if it's not good, you you you, it might not be comedy. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I see people misuse the stage all the time. Like they get up on stage and they just start preaching or whatever, and it's like misuse or storytelling. A lot of people like a funny story is different from comedy, for exactly. instance. Exactly. Like a fun like like I know people with funny stories to say, oh, I could go up on stage. And it always kind of bothers me because, no, you can't. No. <laughs> like, there's something 
extra like and i don't know what it is this is the there's the punchline there's delivery there's there's lots of things that separate funny stories from comedy it's really the rhythm right like i used to think that too because i have a bunch of like i had a crazy past all this i have tons of stories and you get up there and you realize there's not a rhythm to this that's in the same way as stand-up and there's like similes and metaphors that you're using in stand-up and i think if you look at really great comedians they have a rhythm like especially hannibal burris mitch hedberg are really good at this where they they kind of lull you and then boom and it's just not even in what they say sometimes it's in how they they say it in that that ba- backdrop of boom Boom. And I think that's what's missing in a lot of storytelling is that it doesn't have a stand-up like rhythm. Yeah, Mitch Hedberg's an interesting one. And I don't know if we're mentioning names that maybe most of the audience doesn't know, but I would definitely recommend Googling Mitch Hedberg, H-E-D-B-E-R-G, because he's famous for doing, he's dead now, but he's famous for doing all of these uh, one-liners. Total just one-liner after one-liner after one-liner. And when you say rhythm with with his stuff, I never thought about that because I always think the beauty of his comedy was how twisted as one-liners were but if you think about it he's, he's got this weird accent while he's doing them yep. he kind of does have that you know that right accent right on the boom yep. that that gets you like, like i'll just tell you one mitch Hedberg joke you probably know it um i'm not going to deliver it right but uh uh let me see if i can remember it. Uh, uh i was playing my music really loud and the guy in the apartment next door to mine is banging on the wall and I said to him, go around. There's no door here. Go around. <laughs> yep. And so that was like, hit the way, just the way he said around yep. was like funny to me. Yep. There's another one that I really liked. It's like, um, I used to do a lot of drugs. Well, I still do, but I used to too. <laughs> yeah. And just like the way he says it and delivers it and it's, it's, it invites you. And I've noticed that with a lot of one-liner comics, they have their character down quick. I think actually sometimes it's harder to be, if you're naturally funny, I think sometimes it's harder to be funny on stage because you kind of feel you're being insincere to yourself because you're like, I've never written down jokes before and then performed them, you know? I've just kind of been funny. And, um, but like people, whenever they're not necessarily like gregarious or funny in conversation, they can sit down and be very disciplined about how they approach that and really buy into that character yeah no i know comics who um in real life are quite depressed but then they're 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 for me tier one comics like up there with louis ck yeah it's just because they've because i think also there's the the off stage time that they put into it like if you come up with like a, an entire five minute joke where it's just one story but but punchline after punchline after punchline and delivery and rhythm and everything and it took you a year to come up with that joke yep. that has nothing to do with whether you're real life funny or not yep. but it's just you put in the work to be the best exactly and it's an art form and that's what people forget they're like oh you know like uh, i was talking to some guy on the plane and i told him i was a comic and he's like oh man you know i don't know if I, i'm funny like that i'm like no one starts off funny like that. <laughs> that, that that doesn't exist you 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 basically it's it's an art and you have to practice it and it's kind of weird because it it feels very natural but like um it, at the same time it's not natural you're just kind of just standing up there telling jokes with a bunch of people you don't know <laughs> like you know um and but i i think that's the beauty of it but now, okay, so here's the question. When I see like random, uh, uh, so I go to everything from like, you know, Madison Square Garden with whoever to Comedy Cellar to open mics and I watch everything. Even at the open mics, a lot of those guys have been doing it for four or five years and never moving past mm-hmm. the open mic. And you know what? They're not good. Yep. And I, but they've been doing it for four or five years. Yep. But the, and, and then the professionals, like Louis C.K. has been doing this for 33 years or whatever like it seems like it takes a real like you're young are you gonna be you're gonna have to do this another 20 years before you could say you're like at the tier one perhaps yeah well so one of the things about like you can that's the scary thing about comedy if i if if it was anything is you look around and someone shakes your hand and they're like oh how long you've been doing this and and they they tell you seven years and then you watch them go on stage and they suck you're like yo how does that not become me? And But the thing is, is that you have to be self-aware and you have to have friends who are honest with you. If you have friends who are honest with you, I think that's such a big part of it. Because I've had friends where I'm like, oh, dude, like, you know, like, I, like, I know this joke is funny. Like, bro, nah, dude, you just suck. <laughs> like, you know, that was, that, was, that was awful. And telling you what exactly is wrong with it can help you grow. It's that self-aware. But you have to really know how to trust those friends because yeah. it's like you said, even with your mom, you know, her beliefs aren't going to necessarily, aren't valid for your perspective. Pursuit. So this goes back to what my dad taught me. He told me that um, about feedback is don't wonder whether or not they're right. Wonder why is it that that they that they have that impression. 
And to me, that's a lot of stand-up. Why is it that they have that impression that this joke sucks? Like, and I take into account like their background, everything like this. But when your friends, your friends usually have the same sense of humor as you. And if you're not tickling their sense of humor, then a lot of times it needs to really be reworked. And I, I don't think you should workshop with everybody. I think they need to be kind of in your tribe. But it, it, it's it's very. I think that's a very important part of it. The other part is um, is to be. I, I I just can't emphasize enough. You have to be so critical with yourself, and I think sometimes you have to leave your scene. Like if you have like Patrice O'Neill comedy where you're like like super misogynistic and all this stuff, you're probably not going to want to start in Portland or Seattle because like you, you might be hilarious, right? You might be hilarious for your people, but that scene won't ever let you be that funny. And you have to kind of be aware of those things like that. Mm. So to some extent, you can't be in some cases true to your voice. You took the example of misogyny, but let's say that's not your yeah. your voice. Let's say your voice is something else. You, you can't. In some cases, you can't be true to your voice because of the audience. Yeah. Like, how do you be an artist with every type of audience? It was, so the thing is, is the more comfortable you get with who you are and committed and confident, the more it transcends and more you can get people who are even loosely affiliated in that. But I think whenever like you're developing and you're very fragile, I think you kind of need to be in sometimes warmer rooms, you know, because like. Part of the thing is, is also you can't trust the feedback loop you're getting at a lot of mics because like there's a bunch of reasons why sometimes people don't laugh at your jokes, right? Could be competitive, could be they don't know you, could be just the the setup. It could be that you're going up 48th in a, the lineup and everybody just doesn't care. And so it's important to get that authentic read. But um, I think the internet as well is another really great place to find out and workshop stuff. Because like your Twitter people, like if it's authentically funny and it gets a lot of likes, like that can work, you know? And you're like, okay, there's something funny there. Um, but I think it's taking advantage of all these things. And I think a lot of people also fall into this artist mentality. And choose yourself really helped me kind of get out of this. Where it's like, there's a point in time where someone's going to choose you. Where someone's going to say like, yo, it's your time to basically be the big shot. And for me, like... I'm only two years in and, you know, we have our show at the Laugh Factory and stuff like that. But like, I also know I want to grow and I know we're New York, it's happening in New York. But the common like not, thing is like you spent five, six years in Chicago, then you move on. But then I listen to Mark Maron's podcast and there's nobody who I'm like aspiring to be that waited that long, mm. you know? And so you kind of have to have the self-trust. And at the same time, be really critical. And then at the same time, be delusional. Like you can get better. Now you talked about like, how can you aspire to be as great as tier one comics by also taking apart their specials? If you look at a, like Dave Chappelle's new special as a whole, as a whole work, you'll, you'll never feel like you could be enough. Right. But if you look at it joke by joke, break it apart. Like my friend, Nick Ogle, he goes through specials and he breaks, breaks down the entire special. And he sees like why it's funny. Why are people laughing in this context? Things like that. And he builds this huge thing. And so he's really studying it if from an academic way that way whenever he's writing a joke he can diagnose why it's wrong so how how is he breaking it down so because, he, because i think this is this is by the way important in any field like let's say you want to get better at chess let's say you want to get better at swimming let's say you want to get better at golf or or even being a lawyer mm -hmm. you have to break down every it, it's not one thing it's like there's always like a dozen or more different factors in every endeavor that's worth getting better at yeah, well, the thing is you have to identify that. You have to identify why it's funny. And I think that's where reading some books on like basically what makes like TV writing funny and everything like that helps. And what he does is he just like, he writes out the entire joke. He writes out the rhythms and the why they say it. Then he he asks, why is it there? Why did they use that image? And he labels them based on that context. And so he organ then he organizes the joke structure in different folders. So if he's writing a joke with a similar structure, he can go and look at similar jokes that are done well or mm. done poorly like that. And he he is amazing. Like he 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 came out the gates and he's so good. He's also Indian and black. He goes to my same law school and um he lives in my same building. And whenever we start hanging out and he saw me do comedy, I was like, dude, you gotta come out. And his first time performing, he was so good. I had half a mind to be like, hey, bro, uh, yeah, you're all right, bro. You don't need to come back out. But yeah, we, 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 to me, I just watch him and I watch how he takes apart the discipline and really studies it. And I think that makes him a lot better. And the people I've seen... So that reminds me of like, um, like take the movie Star Wars as an example, where it's so clearly uh, fit into a template, you know, the journey of the hero from Joseph Campbell or, you know, it fits in all on all these religious stories. You could almost like map like plot element by plot element to some religious story. Yeah. Uh, it reminds me of that where you kind of take a successful template that's almost been focus group by the best comedian in the world and you try to fit that template but just with like a different idea yeah and 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 it's not as far as like just snatching the whole template but it's like whenever you 
so I think you can use science to diagnose why a joke is wrong, but you can't use science to build a joke. Mm. Um, and I think that's where his his basically his bank comes in handy is when he already has a joke that he's inspired about and he's writing it and there's parts of it that aren't working. He can go look at other jokes that did work and he's like, well, what's what's kind of different about my joke? What am I doing here that is kind of different from these guys? And so uh, it's kind of like this, like, inspiration first because I try to build jokes scientifically after learning some concepts like oh yeah I'm gonna and they just came out like sterile they're uninspired or whatever but if you can basically use science to organize your the way the way you think I think it's um better off so you said but before we began you said that now that the 367 days in a row are over you actually feel now you're improving not going on every day yes what do you mean by that so there's a early on the huge commodity is stage time. You just need to get comfortable with being on stage. But after a while, stage time doesn't add up to getting better, right? It doesn't. You you can't just keep adding the same thing and expecting to tr- transcend your level, right? And so what my next level required was like a lot more of me thinking. And like here's an like some other stuff from like choose yourself is like I was like reading a bunch of different books. I'm listening to lectures and stuff because like I would have these really great ideas, right? But I wouldn't understand what I was thinking enough to even be able to do them. So I was pulling from other sources besides comedy. And that's where me and Nick are kind of different is that I'll, I, I started mixing ideas more. I started staying more in the lab and trying to work them out. And I was like looking at other disciplines to help inspire me in stand-up. So what, what books would you recommend me to uh, to learn more? Or, 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 or even like a, a, a sitcom or video or whatever? So the book that was the most help to me, um, it's a yellow book on Amazon. I can't remember, but it's a stick figure slipping on a banana. And that book basically taught me like a lot of like little tricks on the thing on like oh end with a image you know or end with the funniest word or things like that. And those You don't remember the name of the book? I don't remember the name of the book, but I, when Is I- Is it Interviews? It wasn't interviews. It was um, oh oh, uh, hidden tools of comedy by Steve Kaplan. It might it might be that, but there's, uh, the guy's sitting like slipping on a banana on the front, and um and that one really helped me out, and it had a lot of exercises, and it, it it was able I was able to label a lot of the things in my jokes or in other jokes, like oh that's a metaphor right here, simile. Oh that's alliteration, that's why, or that's a that's a rhyme funny. Mm-hmm. And then there's another dimension beyond the written, right? Is the performance base because like, and the performance is just I think this is where it's important to go watch good comedy because if you're always watching open micers you're not seeing what you aspire to be right <laughs> you know and you're learning and you're actually mirror neuroning a bunch of bad habits so like i think it's important to go out to mics but it's also important to go watch in-person comedy you know and watch how it's done you know so what, what's another book um i can't remember the rest of the books but that one was the one that the rest of them felt distant like there was um the uh, the zen of stand up, but all of them felt like they were written for an age of stand up that doesn't exist anymore, mm. and uh, so I, it just didn't feel as relevant. Um, but I oh Ari Shafir's talk on YouTube about stand up is one of the best talks, um, and Ralphie Mays too. But um, Ari Shafir's is four hours long. Wow. And- and he, but he, he talks about the business, but he also talks about like stand up in a really Zen capacity and like, you know, like a lot, how a lot of it is based on expectation. Like a lot of what you're building up in stand up is your name. So people expect you to be funny. So you don't have to earn them believing in your jokes. And so his, that talk was really great. And I also just, a, a accumulation of a lot of Mark Maron podcasts. Like I, I just, because he's always interviewing stand-ups. Always interviewing stand-ups. And he asks really analytical and hard questions. And he's also a stand-up. So he, it's, it's very precise. Um, and it gets to the root of what people were thinking at that time. Mm-hmm. But a, a lot of it, the, the big thing about stand-up is that it's very Tao. And that like kind of like the way is that there is no way. Everybody's kind of had like this different path. And it's a little bit annoying when you're in it. But then you realize like, oh, hey, like whenever, like I'm, I'm a year and a half in and I've done my own like journey and everything like that. And I've realized, oh, this is why I, this stuff didn't make sense to me at first. But I think writing what you think is funny, like your 10 ideas a day, if you just wrote out 10 premises a day, and like, and even if they were bad, like they were just like eventually just start getting better. Right. You know? All right. Well, well, Will Batit, you know, the Laugh Factory in Chicago. Yes. And also they can find you on uh, Quora, where I, I'm a big fan of all of your answers. Again, you, you obviously we've been talking about comedy, but... Uh, you answer everything from relationships to life to, and your answers are so succinct and wise. I'm a Thank big you. fan of them. And also your podcast, The Lazy Philosopher, where I'm going to appear on that. So thank you. And thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much, James. 
All right. All right. Sweet. Jack, was that fun? That was fun. I, I really, I've never heard about uh, about the subtracting term with regard to comedy before, and it makes so much sense. It makes sense because, like, I, you know, I think about it. Like- Next time on the James Altucher Show. We all know what happened in the election. Yeah. Trump won. We watched some debates. We will listen to the primaries. But you kind of have different ways of presenting it. You have this way of taking the complicated and making it simple. But then it's, of course, entertaining. I like how, for instance, you have weird chapters like what would have happened if all the first ladies, yeah. like the, the men run for president, but then the first ladies run the country. And you describe <laughs> what would have happened in each case. Like we're out of slavery in 1800 because Sally Hemings would just abolish slavery. A couple of the chapters like that one about the first ladies, another one about picking our president by who we'd go on a road trip with. And you think, oh, Trump, you know, golf, private jets. And you think again, think again what it would really be like with him, cooped up with him, you know, for a long period of time. Let's get right down to it. How the hell did this happen? You know, I just want to say thank you to everyone listening to this. I would say doing a podcast is the activity that I've enjoyed most in these past few years. Please take a moment to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or wherever it is you get your podcast. It will only take a second, but it will help other people discover the podcast and it will really show people in general that this is a quality show and that it's worth listening to. You can also check out the show notes at jamesaltucher.com slash podcast. And also, if you want to get my blog updates and other updates that I do, sign up for the newsletter at jamesaltucher.com. Thanks again. I really appreciate you guys. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so... How do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.